Hello, and welcome to the Humanity and Health webinar. I'm Sarah Tracy, and I'm an historian of medicine and director of the Medical Humanities Program at the OU Honors College. For today's In Medicine with History session, I am delighted to welcome two wonderful scholars who happen to be father and daughter. Uh, Professor Rona Seidelman is a faculty member in the History Department uh, and at the Schusterman Center for Judaic and Israel Studies at OU. She is also author of Under Quarantine, Immigrants and Disease at Israel's Gate. She joins us today from Norman, Oklahoma, and she is joined by her father, Dr. William Bill Seidelman, uh, joins us from Israel. He's in Jerusalem. And uh, Dr. Seidelman was a family practitioner uh, in Canada during the HIV AIDS epidemic in the 1980s and 90s. And he is also a world authority on the history of medicine during the Nazi terror. Welcome to your both. It's great to have you here and to have an international reach today. Now, before we begin, I wanna thank our sponsors. Um, this webinar series, Humanity and Health, is sponsored or hosted by this of the Vice President for Research and Partnerships. Our co-hosts are the OU Arts and Humanities Forum, the College of Arts and Sciences, and the OU History Department. So our format today is that I, when I finish speaking, I need to turn the over to Rona Seidelman, and then we'll watch a pre-recorded conversation, an interview really, between Professor and Dr. Seidelman. Uh, the interview should last for about 40 minutes. At the end of the interview, we three will return to your, your screens and we will take your questions. Um, the Seidelmans will answer your questions. Um, and we should have about 15 minutes for, uh, for the Q&A session. So oh, about those questions, um, most of you will have a Q&A uh, uh, link at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, we would love for you to write your questions and submit them uh, during the course of the uh, pre-recorded conversation. Um, that way we'll have a nice queue of questions for the end of our session. And um, since we have a fairly wide geographic reach today, I hope that you will uh, let us know where you're located as you submit your questions. So Rona, Bill, thank you so much for being here. Thank you everyone for being here. And I am gonna turn the baton over to you, Rona. Thank you so much. I just wanted to take a moment before we get to the pre-recorded interview to also to join Sarah in thanking uh, Professor Janet Ward from the History Department and from the Office of the Vice President for Research um, for this invitation to give this talk today, which is very special um, for me and for my father. Um, and then also to my fabulous colleague, Professor Sarah Tracy, for agreeing to be the moderator. This has just been so lovely um, working with you, and it's been so valuable, and we really appreciate it. So thank you very much. So at this point, Connor, our IT specialist, uh, should uh, put on this wonderful pre-recorded interview. Here we go. Okay, welcome to Oklahoma. Thank you. Welcome to Jerusalem. Thank you. Um, I thought that I'd begin with um, some introductions. I am Dr. Rona Seidelman. I'm a professor of history at the University of Oklahoma. My research is on the history of medicine and public health, immigration, and Israel. And my recent book is called Under Quarantine, Immigrants and Disease at Israel's Gate. And it is my pleasure uh, to introduce my guest today, who is Professor Bill Seidelman, who also happens to be my father. 
Dr. Seidelman is Emeritus Professor of Family and Community Medicine at the University of Toronto. He's a family physician and a native of Vancouver. He graduated, excuse me, he graduated medical school from the University of British Columbia and completed an internship in New York City in that extraordinary year of 1968. Professor Seidelman practiced family medicine in Vancouver, Hamilton, and Toronto, Ontario, in association with the universities of British Columbia, McMaster, and the University of Toronto. His clinical practice focused on community health, HIV AIDS, palliative, and geriatric care. He left clinical practice in 2002 to serve as the president and CEO of the charitable health organization Associated Medical Services of Ontario. He was the recipient of the 2003 award from the University of Toronto, the Ludwig and Estelle Juice Memorial Human Rights Prize for quote, showing by example how to make a difference in the lives of his patients, the university and his community. For the past 40 years, Professor Seidelman's research has been dedicated to the history of medicine during the Nazi period, particularly the role of academic medicine. The focus of his work is the exploitation of the bodies of victims of Nazi terror by German and Austrian universities and research organizations and the enduring legacy of this history. He has authored and co-authored more than 50 articles on this subject in leading journals, including JAMA, the British Medical Journal, the Milbank Quarterly, and recently the journal Surgery. Similarly, his editorials have been published in the Los Angeles Times, the Jerusalem Post, and Canada's leading newspaper, The Globe and Mail. Most recently, he's been involved in helping to establish the Lancet Commission on Medicine and the Holocaust. This is an historic cross-disciplinary collaboration of international experts who are committed to rigorous historical study of medicine in the Holocaust and its continued legacy. A fundamental aspect of Professor Seidelman's research has been to emphasize how important it is that members of his own profession, medicine, not only celebrate the nobility of their work, but also take the difficult steps to confront and learn from the shameful chapters in the history of the medical profession. This topic of how and why physicians can benefit from the history of medicine will be the subject of our discussion today. This is part of a larger project that we're working on together. Uh, we will approach this by looking at the history of my father's own medical career, as well as the way that he encountered the history of medicine as a field of research and what it has given him. I hear the traffic behind you, which makes it clear that you're not in Norman, Oklahoma. It sounds a lot more, a lot more busy than what we have going on here on our quiet street. So I thought we could begin. Um, well, first of all, welcome and thank you for speaking to me. Thank you. Um, so I thought we could begin by you telling um, me how you became interested in the history of medicine and the Holocaust? Well, I've always had a, his, um, a curiosity and interest in history as a, just as a personal aside. And I joined a history of medicine journal club at McMaster University when they established a chair in the history of medicine and they uh, Professor Charles Rowland, who was the first professor of the history of medicine at McMaster. This was a specially funded uh, chair. And um, Dr. Rowland established a, a group of people to meet together every couple of weeks or so in his library at, the, at McMaster University to critically review an article on a history of medicine topic. And I willy-nilly chose a particular subject that related to reports that were published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in the 1930s that were that documented the racist and eugenic transformation of the uh, healthcare system of, of Germany during the Hitler period. And uh, 
and it, the more reports in the uh, JAMA were shockingly <laughs> detailed and uh, published on an almost weekly basis and read by virtually every or available to every um, a practicing physician in the United States. Um, uh, and they described in very detailed, um, uh, close detail, what was happening, including the numbers of people that were sterilized, the uh, methods of sterilizations, um, uh, speeches on racism in medicine, by leading professors, etc. And so that triggered an interest in particularly in the role of the uh, leaders of the medical profession of Germany, which was the um, uh, epicenter of the founding of modern medical science. It was Germany that most many of the major discoveries of modern medicine took place and it was the German medical school that provided a, a model for the modern system of medical education that we have today particularly in the United States and Canada. So this so, was your first published paper on the subject was was the tracking the the JAMA letters. Is that correct? No, it wasn't wasn't my first publication, but it was my entry. Okay. My first publication on this subject was in fact uh, the professional origins of Dr. Joseph Mengele, which related to to some of the letters which described the institute and the medical school uh, founded by his his professor, uh, Professor Verschur, where Mengele trained and studied. Uh, uh, I didn't publish about the letters until quite a few years later, but there were other intervening publications on other matters <clears throat> that came up. So that was my entree. Sorry, sorry I'm interrupting you, <laughs> but you're used to it after many years with me. <laughs> yeah, but, so um, I, one of the things that I think is really interesting also about that research group was that right it was a mixture it was it was MDs and PhDs it was historians trained historians and and physicians right is that the, with with Dr. Roland's research group in McMaster University or the journal yeah. club? And, and the, the group consisted largely of physicians, but there was also a psychologist uh, who was part of the group and a couple of other people who were not physicians, but who had a particular interest in the in the history of the subject. And so we ex it was wide ranging in terms of the, of the particular group and uh, quite informal, but, but serious. But when it's, so one of the things that I also see that's really interesting, if that sort of being some of the one of the sort of entries for you, that this then still it became clear, like it could have just been a one off, you know, where you wrote this, did this one paper, but then clearly over time, it became, it was something that you saw needed more inquiry. And well, there was a critical event that took place. So that was when uh, Professor Michael Cater, who was and uh, one of the foremost social historians of modern Germany um, uh, was a visiting professor at McMaster and joined the group. And I met the Professor Cater and I told him about the letters in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And Cater's first uh, response on that was to me was, well, I wonder if there's anything in there about Professor Verschur. And I said, who's that? He said, well, that was Mengele's professor. And I hadn't heard about Verschur before, and uh, I was a sort of novice in terms of a modern German medical history. And so I went back to the letters, and sure enough, there were a number of entries related to Verschur, uh, including the institute that was uh, he was the founding uh, head of at the University of Frankfurt, where Joseph Mengele studied medicine and uh, uh, was mentored by Verschur and introduced to the whole field of uh, um, medical genetics. So that was a, a, a key moment. And that was because I had access to this expertise with Professor Cater, who's been a, an important influence in my work uh, ever since and up until this very day. And so, could you tell me then how you got involved specifically in the issue of anatomical specimens? I know we're well, kind of jumping a bit, but I want to try to get like sort of these main ideas. In, in what came out of as, as a result of this exposure to 
uh, uh, Professor Verschur and his relationship to Mengele and Nazi medical crimes, uh, I became aware of the fact that the uh, universities and research institutes after the war were, there was a deathly silence. They were very protective in terms of making sure as little information about their role during the Nazi period uh, became public knowledge. And uh, people who tried to pursue uh, research into this area uh, were met with uh, uh, a great deal of difficulty. There was, in fact, active repression and oppression of people who pursued that particular subject. But in around 1989, there was an exposure in public exposure of two important discoveries. One was that the University of Tübingen work was revealed that the Institute of Anatomy uh, used the bodies of uh, uh, people who were victims of Nazi terror for the teaching of anatomy to medical students. And the medical students at the University of Tübingen in, 19, in the 1980s who learned of this were very upset about this revelation. That's number one. The second exposure concerned the world-renowned Institute of Brain Research of the then Max Planck Institute of, of Brain Research in Frankfurt am Main. And it was revealed that that institute had in its collections specimens of brains of people, who, subjects, in particular children, who had been murdered during the uh, so-called euthanasia campaign of Nazi Germany. And that, um, and then I, together with an American uh, uh, bioethicist, uh, Arthur Kaplan, issued a call for an international commemoration on the occasion of the planned burial of these specimens. And that sort of set things off. And, and, uh, and what, what, what became apparent as a consequence of this was that every university institute of anatomy in Germany and Austria, which was part of the Third Reich after the Anschluss in 1938, received the bodies of victims of Nazi terror uh, for teaching purposes. Um, and in Vienna in particular, it was revealed uh, that a, a world-renowned atlas of, of human anatomy uh, was based in part uh, on uh, subjects who had been the victims of Nazi terror. This was known as the Perenkopf Atlas of Human Anatomy. I want to get to the Perenkopf Atlas a bit later. I thought maybe we could close with that. But I, two points that I think I want to sort of clarify from what you said, because we, things that had come up when we had spoken before, was that first of all, you you described the euthanasia programs as saying that they were called euthanasia programs, but they were murder. Yes. Right. They okay, were so, murdered. Right. And yes, the these other, were people that were identified as uh, having some type of psychiatric disorder or behavioral disorder uh, who were selected uh, by a, t a medical team who went around to psychiatric institutions throughout the Third Reich and identified these particular individuals with a special marking and were then uh, um, collected and taken to designated euthanasia centers, uh, which had uh, two features. One was a uh, gas chamber disguised as a shower in, in either in the hospital itself, the psychiatric hospital, or next to the psychiatric hospital, and also had on site or nearby a crematorium for the disposal of the bodies. I think one of the, the sort of the, the ideas there is that the, the people who had been deemed sort of unworthy of life, right? That's that, correct. And that were the, considered to be useless life. Right. And also, um, the uh, uh, people, the specialists in neuropathology who studied brain disorders, um, knew about this and, and wanted to exploit these killings in order to capture specimens for their own collections. And, and they had designated certain patients um, as uh, subjects whose brains they wanted to use when these patients had been killed. And I think that, that what you had pointed out that I think is important is by using <clears throat> the term euthanize makes it sound like they're doing something. It's this. It's a term that's very beyond problematic when it's it was you, a euphemism. It's right. a euphemism For, to exactly. uh, disguise uh, what was in fact 
a campaign of organized murder. Okay, perfect. I wanted that to be clarified. Um, and then you had also said that the burials that were happening, that when you called for the International Commission with with uh, with uh, Professor Art Kaplan, right, that it was that these are our standard procedures with in universities, what they do with their anatomical specimens, that these burials, but, yes. but that it was something that you felt that was very important that they acknowledge that there be a commemoration of acknowledging where these specimens came from, correct? Exactly, okay. exactly. And right. there was an arrangement, actually, it was had been legislated whereby the Gestapo killing centers in particular regions sent their the bodies of the victims uh, to a designated university institute of anatomy. So I think and what in, and in Vienna, the uh, regional execution chamber in the regional court was actually not far from from the university, and they had a special uh, uh, streetcar hearse, uh, which would travel from at two in the morning from the uh, killing chamber to the university to deliver the bodies of the executed victims for the anatomy institute. So one of the things that I see there is that you know this is again you had this you encountered the this topic right and then sort of over time with everything these various research projects or various information that you became more and more exposed to about your field right about medicine that you were practicing and how important this was to to research this in, in greater greater detail um, then the one what i wanted to sort of move to sort of pivot to for a second was that all the time that you were doing this historical research you had a full clinical practice as a family physician, right? And it seems to me that a critical turning point in your clinical work was the beginning of the AIDS epidemic in the early 1980s. And I wondered if you could tell me a bit about what this was like. Well, that, that, that arose from an earlier interest in terms of dealing with people with sexually transmitted diseases in early practice in Vancouver, which carried over into uh, Hamilton uh, after we moved in the late 1970s. And then I developed links with people in uh, dealing with infectious diseases. And uh, in the 1980s, we started to see people with this mysterious disease, which seemed to be affecting principally gay men, according to the reports coming out of the, the CDC of the day, uh, out of New York and San Francisco. And uh, we started to see people with uh, particularly gay men um, uh, with uh, strange disorders, um, which were the result of uh, immunodeficiency. And uh, HIV had this uh, effect of, of not causing a severe illness in and of itself, but what it did was kill off the, a person's cellular immunity, making them extremely susceptible to infections by bacteria, by viruses, by fungi. So basically their bodies went into a form of decomposition where they were developing infections of various infections of the brain, the eyes, you know, the gastrointestinal tract, the lungs, and, and uh, the very severe infections that were difficult to, to, to manage. Um, and uh, uh, on top of the fact uh, that in Hamilton, where we practiced at that time when this was occurring, you were uh, dealing with a, uh, this was a conservative community where being gay in Hamilton was uh, uh, not uh, 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 was sort of frowned upon. So it was a largely closeted community as well as there were a number of smaller communities in the Niagara Peninsula where being gay and having HIV would be a very, very difficult situation. Uh, for a, an individual, let alone a family. So, so were, this was a particular challenge to address. What were um, what were the experiences of some of the patients that you were seeing at the time? Well, it was it, first of all at that particular time, AIDS was a death sentence. So that was number one. And number two, um, uh, uh, and so these people were were legitimately frightened, scared to scared out of their wits, 
Uh, many of them were uh, uh, <clears throat> living with their, uh, it was uh, their mothers, uh, single parent families cared for by their mothers who were now at, uh, at a stage of their life that they were now caring for their dying children. Um, uh, and, uh, and also you had within the professional community very few physicians particularly primary care, not just primary care physicians, uh, were reluctant to look after people with HIV and AIDS. Um, and this was, uh, th these were patients who they had known since, since they were very young. And they'd been their family physician for years. And they wouldn't and suddenly them. when they showed up and said, you know, I think I have HIV and I'm gay, they were sort of um said uh thank you very much you'll have to see somebody else i wondered about whether and this might not be whether um having a historical perspective right that you were doing this historical research did that help you in the time in your clinical work right or that thinking that maybe one day medicine will be able to better help these people or was it just that you were dealing with something so terrible clinically at the time that that was really the f just yeah you know, that, the that really didn't come in in terms of our thinking around that time we were just particularly fortunate in terms of we had a team of people in, where i was practicing at the community health center this is the north where, hamilton community health center north hamilton community health center where we didn't discriminate against anybody uh it was a welcome environment the entire staff was very supportive of, of, of they knew what was happening. They were very supportive. And also we had these connections in the community. So word of mouth got around um, on, uh, that extended beyond Hamilton in terms of the smaller communities in the Niger area. And people knew that this was a place where they could receive care and, and, and uh, by a, 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 an understanding and approachable uh, professional staff and the support that they needed so that that sort of um, um, gradually evolved the this you know there may have been some interest in some of the historical aspects but we were dealing with the here and now of people who were dying who were frightened who were afraid who developed severe illnesses that had to be responded to and also we had close links with the hospital and the palliative care and the internal medicine wards and the and the folks there were really quite fabulous. I thought just as a comment, this is something that I'd mentioned to you before, but just I thought that in terms of this sort of conversation, that I think that for me, I've thought about the, the beginning of the AIDS epidemic as a moment that's been very important for the way, for my frame, for how I look at the history of medicine and sort of I remember it as being a very difficult time. I was, I guess, around like seven or six, seven, eight or so. And, but it's something that I experienced through you, right? And that you coming home very upset that your colleagues and people who you knew in, in our community who wouldn't treat AIDS patients, um, you had told the story, you know, I, as, as I recall, and maybe it's that, that there were paramedics who wouldn't carry AIDS patients up to the hot into the hospital and you describing patients as being very, very sick. And it was only later that I understood really what that meant, that these were young, otherwise healthy people who were struck with a disease that was so physically terrible and painful. And then who on top of the physical suffering were being stigmatized and ostracized so terribly. And when I teach students the history of medicine and the history of disease, the fact that they don't know this, right, because they're so young, that they don't know about the tremendous pain and stigma from that time with AIDS. And I feel that it's so important that they learn that and that this field is so important. And that for me is a, is a really sort of clear point where I remember this beginning and I got that you know from you yeah. from your experiences and the way that you sort of taught me to think about this well it was it was very frustrating with in some instances but the gradually uh, folks there was a community of folks that came together which were very supportive of each other and uh, and of the patients of course 
and uh, and we were able to address this. And I'm, I must say that I'm pleased to say I, I heard from folks in Hamilton, and this is what 40 years later, because I, I moved in 1994. So this is what it's 20, uh, 26 years, 27 uh, years later, is that that practice still exists. It's still continuing, although. Fortunately, the management of AIDS has changed dramatically since those, those early days. So now let's skip, um, let's skip back now to your <laughs> historical research and you had touched upon the Perenkoff Atlas. Can you take a moment now to tell me um, sort of, you know, for a layman, what exactly is the Perenkoff Atlas and um, and why is this important? Well, the Perenkoff Atlas uh, is named after um, the head of anatomy at the University of Vienna, Professor uh, Edward Perenkoff, uh, who uh, was commissioned by a leading uh, publisher of an, uh, textbooks of medicine, uh, including anatomy atlas, uh, Urban and Schwarzenberg. And they also had bookstores of, where they sold these uh, books. Um, to uh, produce a new atlas of anatomy using modern uh, techniques of printing. These modern techniques of printing were the four color offset lithography. And uh, Perenkoff had access to outstanding artists at, in Vienna who uh, painted out remarkable watercolor paintings of these uh, of, uh, of, of various uh, body parts uh, of, of uh, some dissections of, of these uh, people who were uh, dissected at the Institute of Anatomy. And uh, the uh, quality of the paintings and the detail of the paintings, uh, plus the uh, uh, quality of the printing techniques uh, resulted in an atlas that was without equal uh, historically and uh, was uh, uh, ex proved extremely popular uh, and was first edition volume was published in 1937 and it was published uh, the uh, ultimately published in at least five different languages and continued in publication up until 1994. Mm -hmm. So tens of thousands of volumes of the Perenkoff Atlas were published. And then it was discovered uh, that in the um, some of the paintings the artist signed their signatures with the Nazi insignia, including a swastika or uh, the SS symbol, the uh, double S symbol of a SS wound, as it's called. And this was revealed in 1994. And as a consequence of this revelation, which became quite well known uh, as a result of efforts uh, by myself together with the, the person who really was responsible for this was an oral surgeon in New York by the name of Professor Howard Israel, who used this atlas every day in his surgery. It was such a, 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 the accuracy of this atlas was such that oral surgeons uh, were dependent, some oral surgeons were dependent upon this atlas because, because of its accuracy, the accuracy of the paintings. And Howard Israel was one of them. And then somebody made an offhand remark about the origins of the subjects of the atlas and. Howard Israel looked into it further and discovered these particular symbols and also raised questions as to the origins of the subjects and how they came to die because they seem to be younger than average uh, subjects of, of, of anatomy dissection. And as a result of, of uh, Yad Vashem, the Israel Holocaust Memorial Authority was involved with this. Uh, and uh, the uh, pressure was put upon the University of Vienna to undertake an investigation into the origins of the subjects portrayed in the atlas. And uh, this resulted in an investigation that, that identified the fact that the over 1,100 subjects from the execution chamber in Vienna were delivered to the Institute of Anatomy. And a number of them are believed to have been portrayed in the Atlas of Anatomy. So this was something that, and just sort of in terms of me getting the timeline down, that, that uh, Dr. Israel, I think in 1994,
had sort of had it had been kind of a question that had been brought to him or that had come up in conversation he said that and then he because this was an anatomy that he used that was so critical to him as to so many other surgeons as well and right. and then he reached out i believe he said to uh, professor lifton was it robert j lifton yes, uh, robert j lifton he asked robert j lifton um, for more information about the history uh, because of Lifton's having recently published a book on Nazi doctors, which was quite famous at the time. And Lifton didn't know anything about this particular issue, Vienna anatomy, etc. But Lifton was a good friend of Professor Michael Cater and wrote to Michael Cater about it. And Cater said, well, you, you should put him in touch with me. And so Howard Israel and I connected because I had my the previous engagement around this issue dealing with uh, uh, anatomy in Germany. I think one of the things that you had come up in conversation with me before that I think is important that you had also said was that um, when you and, and Dr. Israel, Dr. Howard Israel, were talking about this, you said that it, you know if the 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 universities wouldn't pay attention to you if it's just the two of you contacting them. And that that's when you contact you got in touch with the Yad Vashem to sort of support or to be um, sort of with you on this effort in having this commission of inquiry into the Perenkov Atlas. Well, uh, actually, I said to Professor Israel when we were first in touch with each other that if he or I individually were to approach the and I given my previous experience in Germany that we likely would be brushed off and that we needed to have a, an, an, an internationally noted organization uh, with a, uh, an international reputation um, to sort of uh, advance this issue. And fortunately, Yad Vashem was agreeable to uh, take this forward um, in their name. And that uh, it, it still was not easy, but uh, eventually the University of Vienna agreed to undertake an investigation. I think one of the points, and hopefully this will also come up in the question and answer period, but that the fact that this is like that was an inquiry that began in 1994. And the issue of the Perenkov Atlas is as relevant as ever today, right? Because as you said, right, earlier on, you said that it was this atlas was without equal. And I, as I believe, like from what I know from your research, right, is that it continues to be without equal and continues to be such a critical uh, work for surgeons and anatomists to that they that they turn to and so then the question now that they know where the legacy the legacy and they know more about the history and that um, so many of that some of the people in this atlas were indeed victims of nazi terror and murder that how you then use that information is something that you also that you're collaborating on and that and working on now and that other scholars are working on and dealing with now correct yeah. well as i mentioned uh, professor israel in terms of oral maxillofacial surgery this is probably the and uh, they've been looking at this particular issue comparing it with other atlases said this is still the outstanding atlas in that particular area of surgery and also the other area is a nerve surgery peripheral nerve surgery which is surgery of nerves outside of the brain and the spinal cord which extends to the to the chest wall the thorax the arms the legs the pelvis and the um uh, Perenkoff atlas is unequal in terms of as a guide in terms of peripheral nerve surgery and is used to this very day and the leading expert in this area who has raised the ethical questions about the atlas, use of the atlas, is a uh, nerve surgeon at, the, at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, by the name of Professor Susan McKinnon. But Susan McKinnon also is addressing the ethical issues around the use of the atlas and how, in terms of uh, uh, acknowledging where the atlas came from, the origin of the atlas, and that any publications related to it and teaching around the atlas uh, includes a recognition of the suffering of the victims whose bodies were exploited in order to create this atlas. And then there's also uh, the, the work of uh, Professor Hildebrandt, uh, Sabine Hildebrandt, 
at Harvard who's done who's an anatomist is yeah. an anatomy, an anatomy educator is that and and sort of the collaboration that you guys have been doing well there's a, a, a that's an important point and there was now an, a, an international group of collaborators um, and, and, and an important person in this uh, whole area is uh, Professor Hildebrandt who is from Germany and who uh, did her medical training in Germany at the University of uh, Marburg uh, and who was an anatomist and who became interested in this particular subject and then has become the foremost expert on the history of anatomy in Nazi Germany but also extended to the whole ethical issues in terms of anatomy teaching above and beyond. So she, she and she is now a, a leader of the one of the three designated leaders of the, this new Lancet Commission you referred to earlier. I, it's uh, just, I just got underway. I, one of the things that I think about that is that seeing sort of the continued legacy and how much work there is still left to do and that it's sort of the constant questioning and research that has to go into this but that comes from this historical research that yeah. is, has been done and is being done. Well people were taking had no idea around the background in terms of this atlas or the ethical issues that that arose from the use of the uh, use of the atlas. I think because we want to um, than the publisher. Yeah. The present publisher. I um because we want to keep leave be sure that we leave enough time also for um for sort of t the question and answer period. What I wanted to see that um, if you could end with, because what we talked about here is both your historical research, but the fact that you're a physician, right? And that um, that you, uh, this, the, the, you've had your clinical practice as well. And thinking about why you would encourage medical students to study the history of medicine, more broadly, or, or even more specifically, sort of why is the history of medicine and the Holocaust important for medical students? Well, uh, two aspects of this. First of all, the broader issue in terms of history. I think that there are fascinating subjects uh, to explore in terms of looking at the origins of the things that we do today. Uh, and I mean, just in terms of issues related to water purity, for example, and uh, these are still relevant today and looking at the historical aspects are quite fascinating. Um, and then there's the clinical aspects in terms of the origins of certain technologies and techniques that we use today that we take for granted and how they came about. But there's also the other question in terms of us as individuals and the fact that we are ordinary human beings, that we make mistakes, that we're fallible and that um, um, you're dealing in terms of this tragic history of the medicine in Nazi Germany, of the whole question of power and the relationship to the state and the fallibility, the potential fallibility of, of the, the practicing physician and the relationship with institutions and powerful individuals and powerful bodies, uh, be it a university, uh, be it a, a hospital, uh, 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 and be it a, uh, a, a state, be it a provincial state or a national state, and, uh, um, and the changes that occur in terms of that relationship and the, and the influences that are, are brought to bear on, on an individual practitioner. Thank you. I, I, um, I want to just close by saying something that sort of thinking about the way that I've also thought about your work. And in my mind that there are these sort of three aspects or a few aspects of your work that are particularly notable and that I sort of want to call attention to. And one for me is the respect that you have for professional historians. That, that you, one of the things sort of I tease you about sometimes, but that I think is really important is that whenever you give talks, you begin by saying, I am not an historian. I'm a physician who asks some questions, right? And that's something that I tease you about, but that I really also appreciate. And that there, you can see in the history of medicine that there's often, there can be a trend of sort of this celebrated, glorified history of medicine that's really just saying that physicians 
oftentimes who are saying, look at what an amazing profession I come from and let's tell this story and that it's for us to tell this story, but that your critical approach, that you have more of a critical approach to the history as well, recognizing that this is also an amazing and important field or a field of work as a physician or the, the medical field, but that there also needs to be a, a critical approach, but that also that you respect professional historians as having a very important role looking at the primary sources and the work that we do. The other point um, that I think is really important is your collaborative spirit, right? That this is, that you see that this isn't a work that should be just left in the hands of the physicians, but the physicians should be part of this inquiry, but it shouldn't be left only to them. And this should be a collaboration of historians, physicians, ethicists, rabbis, etc. And then the third point is the way that you've really been pushing for new generations of first class historians and scholars to take on this research. And, and th those are things that really stand out to me um, and that I think are really valuable or that I've seen as being particularly valuable in, in what you do. Okay, you've written all of that down, Rona? I've written all of that down. <laughs> Okay, I, I just want to make make one point uh, yeah. going back to what you said at the beginning. And then, we'll, uh, and then we'll end it to make sure that we don't go over time this time. Okay, how much time do I have left? We we have as, as little time as you can take, but I want you okay. to... Okay, I just want to make a point in terms yeah, of... Yeah, please do. Uh, one of the points that uh, Professor Tater emphasized to me at the beginning, and this is when I was at McMaster, which is sort of considered the birthplace of evidence-based medicine, right. when he emphasized that history is evidence-based. Right. So it isn't just medicine, it's any type of academic adventure where you're trying to explore questions, you have to look at the evidence to support what you're saying. I think that's a great point. I, and it's a great point for us to, to close with and hopefully we'll have many follow-up questions. Um, Thank you. Thank you. You can, we can stay on. I'm going to end the recording, but we can keep chatting for a bit afterwards. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. That was such a wonderful uh, and illuminating uh, uh, interview. Um, so uh, I, I will tell you, we've been getting wonderful follow-up questions. Uh, and uh, uh, Bill, Rona, I would like to uh, start um, uh, perhaps with one of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Seidelman, um, Carol Herbert, -Nin, and uh, is, wants you to know that uh, she, she is delighted to see you and um, uh, she admires your work tremendously, uh, and she wonders um, what part of the uh, medicine in the Holocaust story do you think should be part of a uh, core curriculum for health professionals? And uh, since it's not always, uh, I, would, I would ask, um, you know, how do you go about trying to change curriculum and infuse history? into the curriculum, especially this important history that shouldn't be forgotten. Well, thank you, Carol. The, uh, that's a difficult question, and I would defer uh, this one to the Lancet Commission, which is attempting to address this. And the Lancet Commission is comprised of experts, both in terms of the history of medicine during the Third Reich and the Holocaust, as well as experts in the teaching of the subject to medical students and health professionals. And it's a very complex issue. And one of the issues that I think has to be addressed at some particular point is the rapid transformation of academic institutions in the Third Reich that almost on a dime turned from institutions that were the birthplace of modern medical science that became vehicles of the racial and eugenic policies of the Third Reich. And this is something that we know very little about and hopefully we'll be able to learn more about. But I also think that an emphasis has to be placed on teaching deans, administrators, public health officials, government officials who are responsible for health policies, 
and not just place the burden upon medical students, but place the burden upon the leaders who in 1933 to 1945 were responsible for the implementation and execution of the policies uh, that resulted in the greatest program of destruction, human destruction in the history of humankind. Thank you. Uh, Rona, do you want to add anything? Yeah, actually, I do. Um, I think that that was a really great point. And I think one of the things that stands out to me when you say that is how relevant that is today, right? And how we're seeing when we're in the midst of the, you know, this is a discussion that obviously so many people are having, that the devastation that we're seeing from this pandemic, how much of it sort of is preventable, right? And that if only it wasn't, as my father points out, that it is, should, the burden shouldn't be only on the physicians, but the, the failure that we're seeing today of, um, of public officials and policymakers. And, and that's something really that, that I think was so well put and so important that really see the reverberations right now. Thank you. Um, I'll move on to yet another question because we have so many and I apologize in advance for not being able to uh, address them all. Um, but we received a, a question from someone in Norman, Miriam Gross, a uh, professor of history of public health in modern China. Um, and she notes that she was in India in 2001 and there were an increasing number of HIV positive cases, uh, patients, uh, but very few doctors willing to treat them. And in fact, those who did treat them often suffered um, stigmatization themselves and uh, state um, uh, retribution. Uh, the state didn't want to acknowledge the problem initially. Um, and so uh, her questions are these, um, what was it like for you, Dr. Seidelman, uh, as one of the few who would help uh, people who were HIV positive or who had AIDS, even before we knew the, about HIV, um, did it change your relationship with your medical peers? Uh, and then uh, was that only temporary, if it did, uh, or was it long-term? Uh, and how did the state react to your identifying these cases? Was there any kind of peril that you were putting yourself in by actually acknowledging that there were so many AIDS uh, cases in and patients suffering in Canada? And uh, did it, you know, what are, what were the the repercussions of your of your doing this work? Well, uh, first of all, I uh, have to acknowledge the support of my family and particularly my wife, who was uh, tolerated many things during my, my uh, rather eclectic career. Continues uh, to this, tolerate. I'm sorry? And continues to tolerate. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> and um, the, uh, but also uh, I, uh, I have to reemphasize the support of my colleagues at North Hamilton, who were wonderful uh, and uh, not just my physician colleagues, but the entire staff and folks in the community. And also uh, our friends knew what, uh, what we were doing, what I was doing. Um, it did have, I'm sure, some re repercussions, but uh, uh, so what? Uh, these were folks that needed help and we were providing the help. And also where there was a, uh, we were close to Toronto where we uh, eventually moved, become involved with a much, much busier, more dynamic situation where you had a very active uh, um, uh, gay community dealing with the epicenter of the HIV epidemic in Canada. So you had an, an increasing awareness within the community in general around around these particular issues. So it was a, a changing scenario. But I'm, you know, uh, I recognize that in different parts of the world and different communities. In the 1990s, I, we were attended um, a conference in, uh, in a particular city where there's some relatives of ours um, uh, live and we attended a family event and uh, the uh, folks asked uh, why we, what brought us to the city. And I said, uh, so the AIDS conference and suddenly we had half of the room to ourselves. So uh, 
uh, you know, there were differing, differing attitudes by different people at, at different times. Great. Thank you very much. Um, gosh, there's so many questions at this point. Uh, I am I am going to move to Ontario now. Uh, speaking of Hamilton, Ontario, you have a question from Dr. Dave Davis, uh, who uh, is delighted uh, to see you and Rona um, and feels privileged to know you both. Uh, he'd like to know what your thoughts are about lessons for the future, particularly in our current climate. Um, and what your thoughts are about the value of interdisciplinary research um, in the medical humanities, in the history of medicine, the value of history for medicine, uh, and how you think uh, this will fit into your future, uh, into medical education, and uh, what your thoughts are about continuing uh, in historical scholarship. Well, uh, I... <laughs> I'm going to be 80 in three weeks, <laughs> and I've been doing this for a long time, and I'm trying to defer to other folks and younger and a younger generation to sort of pick up some of this stuff. Um, and there is, I, I'm encouraged by uh, younger people who are start beginning to do, so, who are not, who are well, well established in, in, in aspects of this work. So that's very encouraging. However, I am also worried about uh, what I see in terms of the humanities and the relationship to uh, medical education, which I think is an important discipline that that you, Sarah, have been have been actively involved with, and we've shared very briefly uh, some common interests around that. And I think that there's a great great opportunity here. And hopefully, out of the uh, the Lancet Commission, we'll see further opportunities develop in terms of the teaching of the le historical lessons of the Holocaust and medicine and the Third Reich uh, in, in the uh, in the curriculum and in uh, health to health professionals. So I think that there's a, there are great opportunities, and hopefully, people will become sensitive to to the questions, to the issues, and the challenges. Rona, I think you could, uh, you and Tracy in particular, uh, can probably be, are better equipped to address that. Um, I, to be honest, I'm become a little distracted by the questions that I'm seeing come in and sort of doing everything on this sort of international. I can't, I can't see them, so I. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they're they're fabulous and and so interesting. Well, I um, saw John Cairns uh, had a comment. Okay. Um, I, I think, you know, I think for us coming from the humanities, it's always re reassuring, right? We're always looking to see that, that other fields are really appreciating sort of what we do. And I think sort of seeing from, you know, that, that there are very particular skills that we, that we learn also and that we try to enforce or sort of help students learn and, and sort of understanding sort of the way that that can be um, how valuable it is for other fields as well. And I think the more there is dialogue between um, then, then the better. I think it's, it's very, very, very important. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but sort of hopefully. To okay. okay, I should comment that Dave Davis is a very important part of the team in North Hamilton in the 1980s and 90s that uh, was involved in the care of folks with HIV, the person who asked the last question. Well, we are at um, just under a minute, I'm afraid. And I hate to cut this discussion short, but I know that we will have a record of these questions and I will forward them to you. And perhaps you can start new conversations and dialogues. But we are so fortunate to have both of you here today. And um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Connor, our IT specialist, and I look forward to continuing uh, our discussion about the relationship of history and medicine and the value of each for the other. Um, so Bill, Rona, congratulations. This was a wonderful session and I hope we have a chance to talk to you again as Thank a group, perhaps in another humanity and health webinar. I hope in a seminar in real live person. <laughs>
<laughs> so thank you thank again. You very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye.